Dear friends, what does it mean for Jesus to have been tempted? He is driven into the wilderness, having just received the Holy Spirit, which affirmed his greatness. But the first thing that happens then is a purification, a struggling with the devil. It's as if the devil is saying, prove it. The devil is trying to play on the common human notion that we don't quite trust God to do what he says. And he's asking Jesus, do you really believe this? Do you really believe that the Father loves you? We know from the more detailed accounts in the other Gospels that in tempting Jesus, the devil claims all authority over the kingdoms of this world. And Jesus does not deny this. What this means is that as we consider worldliness and worldly power games and so on, it is the enemy that's in charge of the process. Biblically, Satan is the accuser. His is the realm of accusations and finger pointing, and his spiritual fruit is resentment, bitterness and ultimate death. But are these real tests for Jesus? What does it mean for them to be real tests? In other words, that Jesus felt a real pull towards accepting what the devil was offering. What's the meaning of that famous verse from Hebrews, that Jesus was tempted as we are in every way and yet without sin? This story of the temptations is the prototype for that. I wonder if you've ever heard the phrase, feel the fear and do it anyway. That's the virtue of courage. Courage is not about not feeling fear, but about a higher feeling that's more important, the desire to achieve whatever it is one is seeking, despite the obstacles and fears. So one might say of the nature of temptation, feel the pull, but don't do it anyway. Recognise that there is a higher calling. What we're talking about with temptations is how to deal with our feelings. We're talking about the need to control our feelings of attraction towards some things, and indeed some people. This is not in the deepest sense about repression, although it does involve that great fruit of the Holy Spirit called self-control, it's more about replacing one desire with another. When we try and repress our feelings, we usually just give them greater strength, and if we're not careful, we end up being obsessed with what we're most afraid of. But this, by the way, is the spiritual delusion of our modern world, that our feelings as such get discounted. They're seen as untrustworthy, when the truth is this is simply the flip side of our culture's idolatry of reason, for all of our reasoning depends upon our feelings. The challenge is not about repressing feelings, but about refining them. Spiritual growth is essentially the refinement of our emotional nature. It's about learning how to desire the right thing, a process of purification. One might even say the devil is God's agent of purification. Think of what happened in the book of Job. Yes, this is a plug for my Wednesday Lenten sequence. So what are we called to desire? What is, in truth, our heart's deepest longing? Hear, O Israel, the first commandment is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Withstanding temptation is about supplanting the teeming but ultimately less important desires of our heart with this one single most important desire. It may sometimes seem that spiritual teaching is about telling us about how awful our desires are, but all that this accomplishes is the feeling of that our deepest desires is being condemned. This is not the way of Christ. Our hearts are deceitful above all things, it's true, for we are fallen. But it is when we set our hearts on the things which are above that we are saved. Or as St Paul writes in Romans, it's with your heart that you believe. This is how Jesus was without sin. Not that he never felt the pull of desire towards forbidden objects, behaviours or people, but rather that in each and every case he brought those desires into conversation with his desire to love God. Then, in each and every case, his love for the Father was stronger. Jesus was tempted as we are, yet was without sin, and as a result he's the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. May we each be given the grace to walk in the footsteps of Christ, these 40 days of Lent, and always. Amen.